I have with me today, Jerry Kavish. He's the CEO at 3P Marketplace Solutions, and he helps brands bridge the gap between online and offline. Jerry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sergi. Happy to be here. Did I describe what you do correctly? I mean, uh, when you talk to business owners at conferences online via interviews like this, how do you describe what you do in plain terms? In plain terms, uh, I call us a boutique agency that, that works with brands who want to be on Amazon, and, but they don't know how to get started. They don't know what to do. And they often do not w want their um, traditional channels to know that they're on Amazon. Right. And uh, your company, and correct me if I'm wrong, is mostly focused on helping uh, brick and mortar retailers gain additional exposure through Amazon and various online marketplaces. Is that correct? Uh, that's partially correct. We, also, we work with a lot of brands, too. So okay. we we'll work with okay. brands or brick and mortar. And, and it's, a, it's a different process for each of them because they have different needs, different criteria. Okay. And uh, what kind of businesses, maybe by product categories, do you typically work more with? We work mostly with apparel and footwear, and right. uh, we do work with uh, some non-companies uh, that are not in that space, but primarily apparel and footwear, and uh, what I think makes us a little bit unique is apparel and footwear is a little bit more challenging because of all the uh, SKUs that are associated right. with, with the product, and um, whereas many agencies out there are focused on just the widget. And so they're only having to deal with a widget or maybe a two pack or a three pack of the widget. They're not having to right, deal with all right. the variations that we deal with. So, yeah. What, what, what else besides the variation uh, is one of the biggest difference between apparel and other categories? Uh, variations is the biggest uh, followed by the amount of returns. And so right. inventory management is very, very important and making sure that you understand your unit economics um, because your return rates are going to vary depending on your product category, anywhere from 10 to 35, in some cases as high as 40%. Wow. And so making sure that you have a uh, good understanding of what your costs are and you have a good reverse logistics operation um, becomes very important. Interesting. Interesting. And is it true? I mean, I read on your LinkedIn that you were a retailer yourself, right? Before you got started with the agency. Yes, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I think of myself as relatively unique in this space in that <laughs> um, I have, I came from a traditional retail background. Right. Uh, whereas many people come to this space from a data background or some kind of online marketing background. Right. Um, and so I do look at, I think I look at things a little bit differently than some others do. And I understand some of the challenges brick and mortar have, and I, it helps me bridge, um, bridge the gap for brick and mortar to the online space, but also for brands to understand how they can uh, create a um, policies and procedures and processes that complement both their online and offline channels. Right. So you basically understand the, the main pain points of your customers because at one point you were in their shoes, right? Correct. Interesting. Correct. Interesting. Yeah. Love that. Uh, I mean, you probably get asked this question a lot, but uh, is brick and mortar dead with the advent on fast growth of online marketplaces and Shopify and e-commerce in general? Uh, no. Um but it's changing and it's changing very quickly. And what that change is gonna look like five years, 10 years from now, <laughs> talking to 10 people, you get 20 answers. Right. Um, but I, I believe that for brick and mortar, they're, they're really going to have to dive deep into knowing who their customer is and, and really figure out that one-to-one -one connection. Right. And that means they're gonna to have to create technology and processes within their brick and mortar locations to, to gather that information where the consumer wants to give it to them. And they're going to have to figure out a way to make that experience enjoyable and seamless and remove the pain points. Um, and that's why I think you're starting to see some companies do uh, like Nordstrom's, for example, they're, they've started to create um, very small footprints where it is all about, it's a showroom. You come right. in, you have your experience, you leave and then, then they ship it from their, um, from their fulfillment centers or from their stores. Or um, Indochino would be another example of that where um, their stores are really not selling much in their stores, but there is a showroom, it's a fitting room, it's creating the experience, and then they fulfill elsewhere. 
So that would be two examples. And, and you actually see it with uh, the other way around too. For example, Amazon is moving into brick and mortar to create this multi-channel strategy, right? Correct. Correct. They, they're, they're coming together and it's a question of what it's going to look like. And the challenge for legacy retail, whether it be your um, so-called mom and pop store that's on the, on the street corner in your local um, community or the national chain is how do you, how do you become local and relevant and, with, and change your way of thinking? And that's, I think, going to be the largest challenge for brick and mortar. And so I suspect what we see is brick and mortar, what I'll call legacy companies disappear and new brick and mortar 21st century version appear and take their place. And they're going to look very different. They're going to operate very differently and they're going to be very data driven. Okay. And is it true that, uh, I mean, you're saying that, uh, the new brick and mortar stores are going to change, right? They're not going to be as big or as global as they used to be where we had Macy's and Nordstrom and all those huge department stores. Is it true that uh, the new brick and mortar is going to be more localized and targeting the local community in, in their area? I think they're going to have to be localized. Now they still could be a 10,000, well, not 10,000, 5,000 store chain, and they're all over the world, but they're going to have to figure out how to localize themselves. And, and that's going oh, to okay. take a lot of technology, and they're going to have to have a lot of data people in the background who are figuring out what that local community looks like. So that green shirt may sell in store number two, but does not sell in store number 150. So they're going to have to make sure that green shirt's in store two, and they don't put them into store 150. Um, so, so yes, it's going to, and, and they're going to have to bring in a lot of inputs, whether it be um, population, demographics, weather, history, I mean, and they're, they're going to have to have an online presence also, and that's going to help them, theoretically help them understand who their customer is, but they're going to have to really do a lot of um, data analytics, and they're going to really have to slice and dice their um, data to figure out what works for their local, um, for each local um, storefront. That's my thinking. Are there any retail niches um, that might have it easier than others in this transition? Boy, I, I don't think I'm smart enough to answer that question. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I, I mean, you, you mentioned that you work mostly with apparel. I wonder whether uh, there are niches or product category businesses uh, that have it easier than apparel or maybe uh, whose transition into the multi-channel, this multi-channel decentralized uh, retail world uh, is going to be easier than for others, basically. I don't think it's going to be easy for anybody. I think it's going to, it's going to, it, it's going to be a function of who has built the best back end. Okay. Um, and and who has the best data scientists um, working for them, and um, and people who can interpret that data? Uh, it's it's uh, you know managing big data is all the craze um, for a reason because there's uh, you have to be able to take that data, interpret it, and turn it into actual. Um, something that's actionable uh, and and the company whether they're selling widgets or footwear or glasses or what or electronics or whatever that so figures out how to do that is going to be the ones that are going to win in the brick and mortar space i think um you know you look at a best buy for example they seem to be doing a pretty good job um they you know i think they were written off for dead five or six years ago and uh they've been very successful how they've created stores within stores their geek squad they're um they're trying to connect with their consumer base um both online and offline um and they they seem to have a pretty good story and yet they're still in 30 40 000 square foot footprints they um you know they have their few hundred store locations is are they going to be able to continue to scale that or are they going do they need to um scale that down and put more of those foot more of those footprints out there and become smaller more nimble around their community that i that i don't know um 
you know, that would seem like a logical approach to me. Um, just look at what Amazon is doing with their ghost stores or their um, bookstores. They're smaller footprints versus uh say a barnes and noble or right. a grocery store but they're um, very nimble and they're very data driven on what they're putting into those stores and 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 how they're restocking those stores so right and right. You, you mentioned that um businesses have to become data driven and especially they if they have a multi-channel approach but uh do businesses have to build this back end by themselves or uh could they use some ready solutions uh, available that you see on the market? Uh, what do you think about that? There are some really good solutions on the market. Um, and to qualify, I'm more familiar with the, mar with the, with the solutions that are, uh, that are online only at this point. I'm not as familiar with the, um, with the uh, omni-channel solutions that are out there just because that's not the space that I'm spending a lot of time in. Um, but I suspect to get started, they can use something that's off the shelf, but they're going to have to figure out how to customize it to their need. Um, and they may have to, they may have to plug some tools in together, um, but they're going to have to figure out how to do, um, particularly if they're starting from scratch, if they're a startup and depending on how much funding they have, uh, I think they're better off um, starting small and identifying what those key metrics are and staying really focused on those key metrics and then building out from there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough call. So probably it's a combination of um, something off the shelf and then taking the ability to modify, customize it. But that means they're going to have to have some good tech people on their team. Right. Because every business is unique and every uh, logistics process is unique, right? Correct. And uh, I think it goes to building out, um, starting at the end, uh, what, what do you want that store experience, that, that brick and mortar experience to look like, and then building it backward. How do, how do, you, how do you deliver that information so you can provide that? Um, yeah. Right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, and when you work with brands, with businesses, with br brick and mortar retail businesses who aren't present at online marketplaces, uh, like Amazon, Walmart, eBay, mm -hmm. uh, what misconceptions, what most common misconceptions do you have to deal with most often? How do you go about explaining the benefits of what we're talking about right now? All right. Um, the brick and the brick and mortar store has a lot of challenges if they want to get onto Amazon and, and we're going to, I'll, I'll spend my energy sp speaking about Amazon. The brands are in a much better position and that's why we work with more brands than we do brick and mortar stores. Um, the brick and mortar store, first thing they have to do is they have to understand e-commerce and the, e and, and the economics of e-commerce and your smaller companies just don't understand it. And it's a question of how much bandwidth do they have. Um, and so there's an education process that has to take place there where we have to walk through what their economics are and um, does it make sense for them to be FBA or not FBA? Um, as a, one of those general statements to start, I would say, yes, they need to be FBA. Um, but that creates a brick and mortar tends to have a, challenge with that and there's there's an education process that has to that has to has to go with that they also have to get permission from the brands that they carry that they can be on amazon not only they, right. can they right. be online with their own website but then that they can be on an amazon and that is not necessarily easy to do um, and i know myself and many other people like myself when we're working with a brand we are actually recommending to brands that they limit the number of sellers they authorize on the platforms um, and uh, the reason for that is it um, lets the brand control what their message is um, much better and what their listings look like versus having all these people popping up that they can't control. Um, and so it's, it's becoming harder for a brick and mortar to, you know, that's, that's just whether it's your five store chain or your 20 store chain, just to pop up on Amazon and, to, and to be successful. Um, for that reason, that's why you're seeing more and more companies working with brands versus working with the stores. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, but there is uh, an advantage to a brick and mortar business to be present on Amazon. And uh, when you work with those brands, could you uh, guide us probably through the process of how that business comes to be established on Amazon? The brand or a, or a brick and mortar? Which the brick and mortar me? business. The brick, the brick and, mortar, and mortar, okay. Yeah. So the uh, first question we'll ask is, we'll wanna understand what their infrastructure looks like. Um, and, and often it's just a consulting gig. It may be a three month consulting um, conversation with, okay, let's talk about your processes. What is your, what is your uh, inventory management process look like? How accurate is that inventory management? Are, do you have your own website now? What platform is it on? Is it, um, how are you fill, fulfilling orders? What is your accuracy rate? How quickly are you shipping? What is your capacity to ship? Uh, can you, um, is it just somebody in the store randomly runs out there and, and finds something or do you have a fulfillment center set up? Um, you know, how are you managing that inventory? Um, uh, store prepped merchandise looks very different than ship prep merchandise. Um, are you prepared to ha manage or have multiple inventories, meaning a brick and mortar inventory and a fulfillment inventory? Um, you know, and, and, and what, what part of your inventory makes sense to duplicate, what part does it not make sense? It's the 80-20 rule, right? You know, 80% of your business comes from 20% of your product. And right. just because it sells well online in your stores does not necessarily mean it sells well online. Um, going through the conversation with your suppliers of, um, getting permission to represent them online and understanding what, what those policies look like. Do they have a map policy? Do they have a customer service policy? Um, are you available? Are you shipping basically seven days a week at this point um, or available to uh, customer service seven days a week? Are you um, shipping five days a week um, during normal business periods, but fourth quarter, are you shipping six days a week because it's expected? How are you going to handle those volumes? Um, there's there is a lot of conversations that you have to have from a process and system standpoint, and understand if they have the capability to even look at an Amazon um, before you even get into the conversation of all right, if you've checked all those boxes off, now how do we actually start on Amazon? So. Right. And it sounds to me like uh, you're building basically a whole new business from scratch because there's so much that you have to uh, take care of, right? From the system yes. perspective. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so for example, um, smaller store, uh, I'll say smaller stores, you know, you're small. Um, if it's a, if it's a one or two store company, they often do not have very good systems and that's, this, it's not right for them. They, they, you know, they can't just work off their point of sale and, and make it work. They they don't have the they don't have the resources, the infrastructure, or the systems to be successful. Um, Amazon's adding thousands of sellers a day, and they're losing thousands of sellers a day, or they don't right. sell anything. Right. Um, you know, your twenty or thirty or forty store regional chain, they're they're much more likely to be successful. They probably already have an e-commerce presence. Uh, they're large enough to where they could probably have a conversation with a brand to get permission. Um, but again, it depends on what their brand um, uh, strategies are and for online versus offline. And does that brick and mortar, they may have 200 brands that they work with, but only 20 of those brands are willing to let them be online on Amazon. So do they have the ability to limit what they're showing and what they're sending to Amazon? Um, you know, also how do they keep themselves from overselling? What, what are their, you know, that goes back to their systems. Okay. If they have five units in stock, are they publishing all five units to Amazon or, and, and they also have them in their stores or are they only publishing two units to Amazon and they've got three units in the store, but or they have the five units in the store, how do they keep that from taking place and how do they account for that? And, um, and then the fourth quarter, it's all exponential. Um, you know, if your rate of sale on something might be in my example of five units and, uh, they may be selling one unit a day and they're receiving, you know, once a week on that product. Now, if they throw on Amazon that suddenly they're, they may be going from one unit a day to one and a half units a day or two units a day or whatever it is. So do they have enough product coming in? But then when they get into the holiday, they've still maybe selling only one or two units in the store, but now they're selling four or five units online. Can they, can they manage that? So right, it, it, right, so, right. Right. 
the, there's a lot to keep track. And I mean, I think that one of the biggest problem when you have a multi-channel strategy like that, uh, when you sell in different marketplaces, in addition to brick and mortar, is keeping track of uh, your inventory and business metrics and just understanding what, what's going on basically. Because yes. I mean, w w when you have so many platforms, you basically have a lot of different businesses. And um, I wonder, are there any good tools on the market that allow to manage inventory and business metrics uh, for multi-channel sellers? Or if not, uh, how do they go about keeping track of that? There are some fabulous tools on the market. Um, I'm not going to uh, recommend any per se, just because every business is different. But for right. example, your, your company offers um, some excellent unit economic reporting and, and, um, and that is just an example of, of, of what's out there. Again, it comes down to what are you looking for? So if they, are they looking for, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe your system will actually fulfill the order. So if they have a fulfillment system, a warehouse system already as part of their operation, their, their ERP that they have, you plug in very nicely to give them some of that, um, that those metrics and data that they need to be able to evaluate what's happening, not happening. Um, conversely, if they don't have that capability, um, maybe they need to find something that is offering them um, some data analytics, but some fulfillment capabilities. And, and so again, it's really becomes what, what systems do they have in place and how, and, and what is their strategy? What are they trying to accomplish? And then, and then creating that RFP and evaluating some different tools. Um, because each set of tools it brings strengths and weaknesses. Your company, for example, has some very good strengths, but there's just like all companies, some places that you're not quite as strong on. And another Absolutely. tool might be strong where you're not, where you aren't, but they're weak where you're strong. And so Absolutely. how, how, how to manage that and understanding for each company, what, what their needs are, what they have, what they need and where do they want to be. And so there, there is a, um, there's a transition in there. That they have that they have to evaluate. Um, Absolutely, and, so, you know. and judging from, um, I mean, our users, right? Uh, right? Our users typically have a whole stack of tools where seller scale is only one of the tools. Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, we don't offer fulfillment capabilities. We only offer reporting, and you would want to have a tool that would compensate for that. So yeah, correct, correct, and and so yes, and uh, stack was the right word. I was struggling with stack. I'm getting old. I forget words, but that, but that is an important conversation is, is what does your stack look like? And, and that stack has to u include everything from order fulfillment, from reporting to customer service. I mean, uh, CRM. I mean, there's so many different tools that you have to, you have to um, be able to bring together. And fortunately, most tools today are, um, are able to connect to each other somehow, whether it be through, through an API or through an export and then an, and then a re-import. There's some way to bring the you know bring the data back and forth. Um, and the larger you get, the more complex you get. You're going to want to automate that. You know, but early on, there's no reason why you can't be um, exporting uh, information from one place and putting it someplace else. Right. Right. Um, with the hype around Amazon uh, itself investing in brick and mortar stores. And we talked about that, uh, mentioned that a little bit, for, for example, Amazon go, where you just go in, take what you need and go out without paying. And it just subtracts from your bank account. Uh, what do you think the future for e-commerce and retail holds? Could you talk a little bit about that? They're coming together. Um, I believe, of course I'm a marketplace company, so there's a bias here, but I believe marketplaces mm -hmm. are going to get stronger. Um, and online is going to become more important, uh, particularly um, if you're watching this today, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 stay at home orders. Online has become very critical. Lots of stores are closed. If you're watching this three years from now, you're probably remembering <laughs> what it was like when, um, when the stores were closed. But I think when we come out of this, what we're going to find is the consumer behavior has changed and they're, and they're going to be looking for combinations of online, offline. And if you are a brick and mortar company and you have offline locations, I think you can really leverage those um, to help the customer and be where they need to be, whether it be in-store pickup or, um, or you ship it to them. 
and or, or a combination thereof. Um, but I think that's what we're going to see is that the off the online players are going to be moving more into into the physical world and the physical world if they haven't already started to move to the um uh to the online world they 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 have to and typically that tends to be your smaller brick and mortars who have not done something there just having a information page doesn't solve it um but they're going to have to figure out a way to to be online where their customer is because the customer is going to be looking for them and that that is a very different animal than what they're used to and again we're you know i want to clarify we're start, we're speaking smaller brick and mortar versus larger um you know regional companies that have 5 20 30 50 um locations they're in a much better place than the one or two store operation so right and if we're talking about new Judging, but what what you just said, if we're talking about entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs who are building their, their brand, how do they position themselves for maximum success in this uh, world where we have offline and online merging together? Well, if, if they're starting from scratch, if if, right. if you were to walk into my office and then say, "Hey, I have this brilliant idea. I have this. I have access to this product. I want to create a brick and mortar store." My first thing would be is. Um, you have to be in both places. You have to build an online presence as well as a brick and mortar presence at the exact same time. Whatever the size physical space you're thinking for a um, physical space, shrink it down and put some of those resources online. Um, and when I speak online, not only is it a website, a, a transactional website, but it's also your social media. Focus on right. one, maybe two social media um, platforms. Um, based on wh who your customer is or likely to be and be really, really good at that. And so that means that they're, they're going to have to have somebody who's really good about the in-store experience, but they're going to have to have somebody who's really good about the, um, about the online experience. And that probably means find yourself a good partner. Uh, <laughs> somebody who, um, I'm serious because um, with different set of skill sets, because it, they, they are two different skill sets. And you need and you need somebody who is focused on the brick and mortar, and you need somebody who's focused on the online. And then together, you have to create your strategy of how those are going to complement each other and drive it forward. Um, so, I think that's yeah. great advice. I have one last question for you, Jerry. It's our yes. ending question uh, from Peter Tills' book, actually zero to one. He was talking uh -huh. about IT startups, but I think that this question can be applied to business in general and Amazon in particular. What is your contrarian view that goes against commonly accepted notions in the industry? What is my contrarian view that go? Basically, what truth uh, do very few people agree with you on? All right, so I guess that as important as FBA is, um, you have to have a strong self-fulfillment capability yourself, whether for both Amazon and non-Amazon. Um, and I, I, you know, FBA is critical for being successful on Amazon but you need to know what, which products to have on Amazon and which products to fulfill yourself. And I see too many people who look to Amazon to be 100% of the solution. And Amazon is not everything is the right product to be on Amazon. You can still be selling it on Amazon, but it's not the right product to be warehoused by Amazon, warehoused and handled by Amazon. And why is that? Could, could you elaborate? Uh, there's some products they do a poor job of, of packing. Uh, we have... Um, for example, we have one product that comes to mind that needs to be packaged in a specific way. And we have, um, uh, Amazon has concurred it has to be packaged in that certain way and it's supposed to be packaged in that certain way and they cannot seem to ship it packaged correctly. So we'd have a lot of breakage and damage and so we had to pull it out and we fulfill that ourselves um, or through our network. Um, there's also products that are, um, they, 
and this goes back to the unit economics we were speaking about, which, which, which you provide, there are some sizes that don't perform as well as other sizes. And so um, let's talk about a pair uh, or a style of men's footwear. So men's footwear, it might go from size seven to 15. Well, most right. people are from nine to 11 and those make perfect sense to be an FBA because you're turning them fast enough. However, that size 14 or 15 or that size seven or seven and a half, you only sell a few units a year. Well, those are going to incur incredible storage fees and cost if you um, keep them at Amazon. And so you need to have a way of fulfilling those yourselves because you do not want those to be at Amazon because you can store those and keep those and fulfill those less expensively when you take all the associated costs that go into an item, into a SKU, into account. Um, and that's a place where I've had conversations with people where they don't necessarily agree, but that would probably be the, the one contrarian view that immediately comes to mind. I have others, but those are sort of our uh, claim to fame, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that was great, Jerry. That was great. Where can people learn more about you and your business? Uh, 3pmarketplacesolutions.com. And that, that is a very simplistic website that gives some basic information. Uh, fill out the, um, the inquiry form and you will hear from me because I, I do all the um, initial inquiries and scoping to see if it makes sense for for us to work together and so amazing thanks jerry you're welcome thank you